The passages in the canon where the Buddha teaches children are some of the most interesting passages. And they're good to reflect on, even though we're not children. Still parts of our minds are children. But it's also the fact that when the Buddha was teaching his son, for example, he put a lot of thought into what would be the most important things to teach. How could he boil down the essence of the teaching so that his son could understand it and put it into practice? So when all the concepts of the Dharma start seeing, seeming to proliferate out of, out of control, it's good to come back to the basic principles. both for your own practice, and if you have any dealings with children, it's good to think about it, how you can bring these principles into your teachings to the children. The Buddha starts out with the principle of truthfulness. You get the impression when you read the passage that his son had told a lie that day, because when the Buddha comes to see him, Rahula, the son, sets out some water with a dipper for the Buddha to wash his feet. So the Buddha washes his feet with the water and leaves a little bit of water in the dipper. And they ask Rahula, do you see this little bit of water in the dipper? Yes. That's how little goodness there is in someone who tells a deliberate lie without any sense of shame. And imagine Rahula cringing a little bit. Then the Buddha takes the water and throws it away. He says, see how that water is thrown away? Yes. That's what happens to the goodness of a person who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. It gets thrown away like that. Then he turns the dipper upside down. See how the dipper is turned upside down? Yes, yes, yes. That's what happens to the goodness of a person who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. It gets turned upside down. Then he shows the ruler how empty and hollow the dipper is, and of course sets a symbol for her how empty and hollow a person's goodness is if they have no sense of shame over telling a deliberate lie. And the Buddha goes on to say, if, you, if you're willing to tell lies, then there's no evil you won't do. Again, tell lies with no sense of shame. There's no evil you won't do. It gives the image of an elephant. If the elephant goes into battle but it protects its trunk, it's a sign that there are certain things it won't do. But if it doesn't protect its trunk, okay, it can do anything. So if you protect the principle of not telling a deliberate lie, okay, there are certain things you will not do. Are there other bad things you won't do? This is starting out with the principle of truthfulness. As elsewhere, the Buddha says that what he wants in a student is someone who's truthful, who doesn't hide things. who is open about his faults, is open about areas where he needs further training. The second thing he wants is someone who is observant. In this particular case, it's observant of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what results you get. He tells Rahula, you look into your actions as you look into a mirror to see yourself. Before you act, you ask yourself, this action I'm going to do, and this can be in thought or word or deed. What results do I expect? If I expect any harm either to myself or others, I won't do it. The Buddha says that should not be done at all. If you don't expect any harm, go ahead and do it. But while you're doing it, keep an eye out for the results that are coming. Because some of the things you do, don't wait until the next lifetime to show the results. You Put your finger in the fire, and it's not going to be the next lifetime that you get the finger burned. It's going to be burned right now. So if you see any harm that's coming that you didn't expect, you stop doing what you're doing. If not, you can keep on going. When you're done, you're still not done. You have to look at the long-term results. Because some actions don't show their results immediately. It takes time. But if you see that something you did led to some harm, then you Resolve not to repeat it, and then you go talk it over with someone else. If it was an act, a deed, or something you said, and see what re recommendations you get. You want to look for someone who is experienced, so they can give you good advice, what you might have done instead. 
and then you resolve not to repeat the mistake. It was something that you simply thought that led to bad results. In other words, it damaged your mind. You don't have to tell anybody else, but you should still have a sense of shame. And shame here is not the debilitating kind of sense of shame that psychiatrists talk about. Try to get people past. It's the healthy sense of shame that comes from having a sense of self-esteem and realizing that certain things are beneath you. And then you resolve not to repeat the mistake. And as the Buddha said, anybody who's going to purify their thoughts, words, and deeds, this is how they do it. This is how you get past delusion. We were talking the other day about how it's easy to see when you're angry or easy to see when you're greedy. But when you're deluded, you can't see because you're deluded. But you learn by observing your actions. This is that second quality that Buddha looked for in, in a good student, someone who is observant. Now, there's a lot of implications in these teachings. First having to do with the qualities of mind you're trying to develop. The first is heedfulness, realizing that your actions do have results, and you want to be very careful because sometimes they can cause harm. So you want to be careful about what you do. There's also the implication that your intentions do make a difference. You want to act on compassion and intentions. In other words, you don't want to cause any harm. Then you have a sense of integrity. If you make a mistake, you want to be open about it. Because if you can't be open to other people about your mistakes, after all, you're not open to yourself. So those are some of the qualities of mind we're trying to develop as we practice integrity, truthfulness, heedfulness, compassion. But the instructions also have some implications about what actions can do in our lives. After all, he's, as the Buddha said, it's if you believe that everything you experienced was caused by some outside power, or it was totally random, or it was totally determined what, by what you did in the past, there's no way you can practice. You have to have a sense that what you're doing right now can make a difference. So the basic assumption here is that we do have some freedom of choice. We are responsible for our actions, and our actions really do have results. Some people say the Buddha never answered metaphysical questions, but this is a metaphysical issue, the fact that actions really do shape our lives. As the Buddha said, he can't prove it to you ahead of time. But if you take that as a working hypothesis, you find that you get more skillful in your actions, your life begins to improve. And if you take this principle all the way, it leads to awakening. And when you achieve awakening, then that's when you realize it really is true. Your actions do make a difference. And it's the intentions behind them that determine what kind of actions they're going to be. Finally, there are the implications as to what we have to do to practice. We have to be alert to what we're doing, why we're doing it, and alert to the results we're getting. We have to put our heart into trying to do it well. So that's alertness, ardency. And then when you learn lessons, you want to remember them so you can apply them the next time. That's mindfulness. So all these teachings that we associate with the Buddha about the qualities of mind we want to develop, the principle of action the importance of action, and also the qualities of mind we need specifically to develop as we meditate. They all come from this instruction. So you see the Buddha was packing a lot into those words to Rahula. So the good words to keep in mind. When we read about the Buddha's teachings and things start getting very complex, remember these principles. Because they apply to your daily life, they apply to your meditation, and they apply to your sense of what you can accomplish in life, where you should focus your attention. You want to focus your attention on doing things skillfully. You focus your attention on your intentions.
because they're going to shape your life. This is why we practice meditation, so we get to know our intentions well. And we begin to sort out which ones are skillful, which ones are not. We develop concentration so we can have the strength, one, to see these things, the, the continuity of intention or attention, so we can see actions and the results and see the connection between the two. We also need concentration as food, because looking at your own faults is not a pleasant thing. You want the pleasure and the sense of fullness and refreshment that come from concentration so you can look at your actions and not get knocked over when you realize you've done something unskillful. Or you uncover some unskillful habits of mind that you had denied were there. And the strength of concentration, the sense of being nourished by your concentration, also give you the strength you need in order to say no to unskillful intentions. Because a lot of them will come and say, well, I can tempt you with this little bit of an instant pleasure. In other words, while you're doing the action, it's going to be pleasant. Who cares about what happens afterwards? And if the mind is weak, it'll give in. You want the strength to be able to say no to unskillful things that are pleasant to begin with, but cause trouble down the line. You also need the strength to say yes to actions that are hard to begin with, but you know are going to give good results. So everything comes out of this principle of action. It's good to reflect on it. This is why we chant it every day. I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions. All living beings are the owners of their actions and heir to their actions. And this reflection is good for lots of different things. As part of the five recollections, we start out with aging, illness, and death, and separation. It's all pretty depressing. If we stop there, it's depressing. But if we go on to that fifth contemplation, that shows the way out. We may not be the owner of our bodies that grow age. We may not be in control over whether our relationships and the things we want are going to stay with us. But we do have some control over our actions. And the goodness that we do with our actions doesn't disappear. It becomes our foundation. The quality of mind that goes along with this is called basada, a sense of confidence. That you can focus on your actions and they will provide you with the protection you need. They'll provide you with the support you need as you face the difficulties of life. And that other reflection, reflect on how all living beings are the owners of their actions. It's interesting that's listed as a reflection for equanimity. What this means is there are times when you want to help somebody and you can't. Either they refuse the help, or no matter how much you try to help them, and no matter how much they're willing to get your help, still something gets in the way. That's when you have to realize there are limitations on how much you can do. So you put aside the things that you can't change, so you can focus on things that you can. Just reflection on karma is useful in all aspects of the practice. When you're spreading thoughts of goodwill, what are we actually saying? We're saying, May all beings understand the causes of true happiness and act on them. It's not the fact that our thought of goodwill is like a magic wand that's going to spread happiness and light wherever, whichever direction we point it. What we're doing is getting our intentions straight, that we don't want to cause anybody any harm, and we're happy to help other people as they work on their, in their own quest for happiness. Because again, it comes down to our actions. If there are no actions to support a quest for happiness, it's not going to happen. So whenever you have any questions about what the Buddha taught, what the implications are, always try to connect everything to the principle of karma. That we choose our actions. And the more attention we bring to the process, the more mindfulness, alertness, and ardency we bring to the process, 
the wider our range of choices will be. And we learn how to take advantage of this fact that we do have these choices. This is one level of freedom. that It's not the ultimate freedom, but it's where we begin to gain a sense of freedom in our lives. And as we pursue this issue, we find that it leads us out to a different kind of freedom, a freedom that's not conditioned at all. So the basics of the Buddha taught rule are not just basics that you learn when you're a little child and then you forget. They're the kind of basics that you keep with you all the time. It's like when you're playing tennis. First lesson is keep your eye on the ball. You never forget that. Even when you become a great pro, you still have to keep your eye on the ball. In the same way when you practice, keep your eye on your actions. Because that's where everything would become clear. <laughs>